This is A Course in Miracles. Do not be afraid to take it. Step forward with great willingness into an abbreviated version, one that we hope you will find both easy to understand and enjoyable. Hi, my name is Beth Gear, author of Awakening to One Love, and along with film producer John Overby, we're excited to present to you this video series on each of the 31 chapters from the text of A Course in Miracles. I have carefully selected quotes from each of the chapter sections in order to reduce them to their clearest meaning. Each section is then followed by a brief summary in order to help deepen the message. We have done this only to be truly helpful to you and to further your understanding of A Course in Miracles. Peace be with you as you journey into love. A Course in Miracles Chapter 14 Teaching for Truth Introduction Yes, you are blessed indeed, yet in this world you do not know it. But you have the means for learning it and seeing it quite clearly. We have followed much of the ego's logic and have seen its logical conclusions. Let us now turn away from them and follow the simple logic by which the Holy Spirit teaches the simple conclusions that speak for truth and only truth. In summary, the introduction is saying, This short introduction is quite clear and needs little explanation. We are blessed beyond our current comprehension, but once we let go of the ego's teachings, we will learn the truth of who we are. Section 1 the conditions of learning. If you are blessed and do not know it, you need to learn it must be so. That is why miracles offer you the testimony that you are blessed. If you decide to have and give and be nothing except a dream, you must direct your thoughts unto oblivion. And if you have and give and are everything, and all this has been denied, your thought system is closed off and wholly separated from the truth. Seeing is always outward. The thoughts the mind of God's Son projects or extends have all the power that He gives to them. The thoughts He shares with God are beyond His belief, but those He made are His beliefs. They will not be taken from Him, but they can be given up by him, for the source of their undoing is in him. Undoing is indirect, as doing is. You were created only to create, neither to see nor do. The Holy Spirit, therefore, must begin his teaching by showing you what you can never learn. His message is not indirect, but he must introduce the simple truth into a thought system which has become so twisted and so complex you cannot see that it means nothing. But you who cannot undo what you have made, nor escape the heavy burden of its dullness that lies upon your mind, cannot see through it. Those who choose to be deceived will merely attack direct approaches, because they seem to encroach upon deception and strike at it. In summary, section 1, The Conditions of Learning, is saying, We are so embedded in the thought system of the ego, we cannot conceive of learning anything else. We have only known ourselves as separate bodies, living in a world of separation since birth. We remember nothing else, and so we can conceive of nothing else. Here, then, is the Holy Spirit's task, to teach us we are the opposite of what we think we are. We are blessed and do not know it. We cannot undo our false beliefs alone, and yet the Holy Spirit must tread carefully around our ego beliefs, lest we simply reject the new beliefs outright, being too threatening to the ego's existence. The condition of learning is merely our willingness to give up our old beliefs about who we are in truth. 
Section 2. The Happy Learner The Holy Spirit needs a happy learner in whom his mission can be happily accomplished. You, who are steadfastly devoted to misery, must first recognize that you are miserable and not happy. The Holy Spirit cannot teach without this contrast, for you believe that misery is happiness. The Holy Spirit, seeing where you are, but knowing you are elsewhere, begins his lesson in simplicity with the fundamental teaching that truth is true. This is the hardest lesson you will ever learn, and in the end, the only one. The simple and the obvious are not apparent to those who would make palaces and royal robes of nothing, believing they are kings with golden crowns because of them. All this the Holy Spirit sees, and teaches, simply, that all this is not true. To those unhappy learners who would teach themselves nothing and delude themselves into believing that it is not nothing, the Holy Spirit says with steadfast quietness, The truth is true. Nothing else matters. Nothing else is real, and everything beside it is not there. Let me make the one distinction for you that you cannot make, but need to learn. Your faith in nothing is deceiving you. Offer your faith to me, and I will place it gently in the holy place where it belongs. You will find no deception there, but only the simple truth, and you will love it, because you will understand it. They will be happy learners of the lesson this light brings to them because it teaches them release from nothing and from all the works of nothing. When you teach anyone that the truth is true, you learn it with him. Learn to be a happy learner. You will never learn how to make nothing everything. If you would be a happy learner, you must give everything you have learned to the Holy Spirit to be unlearned for you and then begin to learn the joyous lessons that come quickly on the firm foundation that truth is true. Behold your brothers in their freedom, and learn of them how to be free of darkness. God is everywhere, and his Son is in him with everything. In summary, Section 2, The Happy Learner, is saying, a happy learner is one who is willing to accept the only truth that has ever been true. We are eternal beings, eternally united with each other and our Creator. The happy learner begins to accept this truth through relinquishing the idea that anything less could be real. Nothing we see with our physical eyes will last for all eternity. The truth states that only what is eternal is real. And so, our current reality must be nothing. This does not mean we should cease to care for this world, our bodies, and each other. On the contrary, we should care more. For only love can teach us that we are love. And to learn we are love, we must learn to see it everywhere. The happy learner has learned they do not live in a world of darkness, separation, and physical bodies. But rather, we live in God's love, which is everywhere and in everything. Knowing this makes learning a happy process. Section 3. The Decision for Guiltlessness The happy learner cannot feel guilty about learning. This is so essential to learning that it should never be forgotten. The guiltless learner learns easily because his thoughts are free. Whenever the pain of guilt seems to attract you, remember that if you yield to it, you are deciding against your happiness and will not learn how to be happy. Say, therefore, to yourself, gently, but with the conviction born of the love of God and of his Son, What I experience I will make manifest. If I am guiltless, I have nothing to fear. I choose to testify to my acceptance of the atonement, not to its rejection. I would accept my guiltlessness by making it manifest and sharing it. 
Let me bring peace to God's Son from his Father. Each day, each hour and minute, even each second, you are deciding between the crucifixion and the resurrection, between the ego and the Holy Spirit. The ego is the choice for guilt, the Holy Spirit the choice for guiltlessness. The miracle teaches you that you have chosen guiltlessness, freedom, and joy. It is not a cause, but an effect. The way to teach this simple lesson is merely this. Guiltlessness is invulnerability. Those who accept the atonement are invulnerable. Nothing can shake God's conviction of the perfect purity of everything he created, for it is wholly pure. Do not decide against it, for being of him, it must be true. The Holy Spirit knows that all salvation is escape from guilt. Let him, therefore, be the only guide that you would follow to salvation. Seek not to appraise the worth of God's Son, whom he created holy, for to do so is to evaluate his Father and judge against him. Say to the Holy Spirit only, Decide for me, and it is done. How gracious it is to decide all things through him whose equal love is given equally to all alike. You have taught yourself the most unnatural habit of not communicating with your Creator. Whenever you are in doubt what you should do, think of His presence in you and tell yourself this and only this. He leadeth me and knows the way which I know not. Yet He will never keep from me what He would have me learn. And so I trust Him to communicate to me all that he knows for me. Then let him teach you quietly how to perceive your guiltlessness, which is already there. In summary, section three, the decision for guiltlessness is saying. We established in chapter 13 that the word guilt can be equally substituted with the word body, and so, our decision for guiltlessness is really the decision to see ourselves as bodiless. This frees us from all pain and suffering because our thoughts are free of all harm caused by the body, knowing it is not who we are. It is a miracle to choose to see yourself as guiltless or bodiless because it is the decision to be free and therefore happy. This is salvation, the escape from all guilt or the escape from the pain and suffering of the body. We cannot perceive bodilessness with our bodily eyes, but the Holy Spirit can, and so we must ask for his assistance in seeing through his eyes. This is the decision to see guiltlessness, or everyone's true identity, our bodilessness, as one eternal love. Section 4 your function in the atonement. When you accept a brother's guiltlessness, you will see the atonement in him. His guiltlessness is your atonement. When you have let all that obscured the truth in your most holy mind be undone for you and therefore stand in grace before your Father, he will give himself to you as he has always done. Atonement becomes real and visible to those who use it. On earth, this is your only function, and you must learn that it is all you want to learn. Decide that God is right and you are wrong about yourself. Fail not in your function of loving in a loveless place made out of darkness and deceit, for thus are darkness and deceit undone. Your function here is only to decide against deciding what you want, in recognition that you do not know. When you have learned to decide with God, all decisions become easy and as right as breathing. There is no effort, and you will be led as gently as if you were being carried down a quiet path in summer. You who are tired will find this more restful than sleep. Unless you are guiltless, you cannot know God, whose will is that you know him. 
Yet, if you do not accept the necessary conditions for knowing him, you have denied him and do not recognize him, though he is all around you. The guiltless and the guilty are totally incapable of understanding one another. God can communicate only to the Holy Spirit in your mind because only he shares the knowledge of what you are with God. Everything else that you have placed within your mind cannot exist, for what is not in communication with the mind of God has never been. In summary, section 4, your function in the atonement is saying, Our function in the atonement is to cease to define ourselves as we see fit. It is to realize that we do not know our own identity as God created us in his love. It is our function to decide that God is right about us and we have been wrong. Once we accept the guiltlessness or bodilessness identity of our brethren, we will see our oneness, the atonement in them. So let us decide with God that his definition of us is true. Let us cease to resist him, and then all our effort and strain will cease as well. Life will become as gentle as a quiet path in summer. Unless we decide to see everyone as guiltless or bodiless, we will be blocking our communication with the Holy Spirit. We know bodies cannot truly join with spirit. Only the mind can. Therefore, only through our mind can we fulfill our function in the atonement, the acceptance of our unity. Section 5. The Circle of Atonement The only part of your mind that has reality is the part that links you still with God. Everyone has a special part to play in the atonement, but the message given to each one is always the same. God's Son is guiltless. Your only calling here is to devote yourself with active willingness to the denial of guilt in all its forms. To accuse is not to understand. The happy learners of the atonement become the teachers of the innocence that is the right of all that God created. The inheritance of the kingdom is the right of God's Son, given him in his creation. We are all joined in the atonement here, and nothing else can unite us in this world. So will the world of separation slip away, and full communication be restored between the Father and the Son. Teachers of innocence, each in his own way, have joined together, taking their part in the unified curriculum of the atonement. Each effort made on its behalf is offered for the single purpose of release from guilt to the eternal glory of God and his creation. There is no pain, no trial, no fear that teaching this can fail to overcome. Join your own efforts to the power that cannot fail and must result in peace. Peace, then, be unto everyone who becomes a teacher of peace. Stand quietly within this circle and attract all tortured minds to join with you in the safety of its peace and holiness. Blessed are you who teach with me. I stand within the circle, calling you to peace. Stand not outside, but join with me within. Fail not the only purpose to which my teaching calls you. Restore to God his Son as he created him. By teaching him his innocence. Each one you see you place within the holy circle of atonement or leave outside, judging him fit for crucifixion or for redemption. If you bring him into the circle of purity, you will rest there with him. If you leave him without, you join him there. Come, let us join him in the holy place of peace, which is for all of us, united as one within the cause of peace. In summary, Section 5, The Circle of Atonement is saying, The Circle of Atonement is merely the place within your mind where you have decided whether we are guilty bodies or whether we are united in spirit 
and bodies play no part in the truth of our being. If you decide we are bodies, then you choose to stand outside the circle of atonement, and suffering will be your experience. If you decide we are one in truth and overlook our seeming separation, you will have placed yourself and everyone you see within the circle of atonement, where we will rest in quiet forgiveness of all that is not true. The circle of atonement is the safe refuge from all that the world shows us. Seek to know our unity there, and you join with God in his holy place of peace. Section 6. The Light of Communication The journey that we undertake together is the exchange of dark for light, of ignorance for understanding. The quiet light in which the Holy Spirit dwells within you is merely perfect openness in which nothing is hidden and therefore nothing is fearful. Attack will always yield to love if it is brought to love, not hidden from it. There is no darkness that the light of love will not dispel, unless it is concealed from love's beneficence. Death yields to life simply because destruction is not true. You have regarded the separation as a means for breaking your communication with your Father. You who speak in dark and devious symbols do not understand the language you have made. It has no meaning, for its purpose is not communication but rather the disruption of communication. You know not what you say, and so you know not what is said to you, yet your interpreter perceives the meaning in your alien language. The Holy Spirit's function is entirely communication. He therefore must remove whatever interferes with communication in order to restore it. We must open all doors and let the light come streaming through. No one can fail to come where God has called him, if he close not the door himself upon his Father's welcome. In summary, section 6, The Light of Communication is saying, The Holy Spirit is the communication link between us and God. This link can never be broken, but we can close our ears to his voice. We have used the idea of separation as the means through which to do this. Bodies symbolize the idea of our separation, symbols of the dark voice of the ego proclaiming our body is all we have. It is the symbol of our attack on God, who knows we are eternal. Yet the light of the Holy Spirit's communication says that death will always yield to life simply because you cannot die, for you are not separate from God, who is life. The only thing that interferes with our understanding of the Holy Spirit's communication is our steadfast belief in being bodies. We do not know we are proclaiming our independence from God through being a body. We think it natural to live in this way, in these bodies. And yet, if we unlocked our belief in this identity, we would open wide the door to the light of understanding and the Holy Spirit's communication. Section 7. Sharing Perception with the Holy Spirit What do you want? Light or darkness, knowledge or ignorance are yours, but not both. In union, everything that is not real must disappear, for truth is union. As darkness disappears in light, so ignorance fades away when knowledge dawns. Perception is the medium by which ignorance is brought to knowledge. The search for truth is but the honest searching out of everything that interferes with truth. It is not possible to convince the unknowing that they know. To God, unknowing is impossible. It is therefore not a point of view at all, but merely a belief in something that does not exist. It is only this belief that the unknowing have, and by it they are wrong about themselves. They have defined themselves as they were not created. Light cannot enter darkness when a mind believes in darkness and will not let it go. Defenses, like everything you made, 
must be gently turned to your own good, translated by the Holy Spirit from means of self-destruction to means of preservation and release. Joining with Him in seeing is the way in which you learn to share with Him the interpretation of perception that leads to knowledge. It is the recognition that nothing you see means anything alone. God has one purpose which He shares with you. The single vision which the Holy Spirit offers you will bring this oneness to your mind with clarity and brightness so intense you could not wish for all the world not to accept what God would have you have. In summary, Section 7, Sharing Perception with the Holy Spirit is saying, We cannot see through both the eyes of the ego and the vision of the Holy Spirit at the same time. It is easy to understand that this would be impossible. And so we must decide, Do we want to see darkness or light? Here we are being told that knowledge is light. What is it we must learn to know? That we remain as we were created, as God's eternal Son, in union with Him and each other. Light is the acceptance of this knowledge, and darkness is the preservation of an identity that will self-destruct in time. It is literally self-destructive. We live in a world seeing bodies all around us, and so we must learn to perceive differently in order to overcome the barriers to light the ego has erected. One way is to recognize that nothing we see means anything alone without the shared perception of the Holy Spirit. Section 8. The Holy Meeting Place In the darkness you have obscured the glory God gave you, and the power he bestowed upon his guiltless Son. Banish not power from your mind, but let all that would hide your glory be brought to the judgment of the Holy Spirit, and there undone. He has promised the Father that through him you would be released from littleness to glory. Everything that promises otherwise, great or small, however much or little valued, He will replace with the one promise given unto him to lay upon the altar to your father and his son. Can you offer guilt to God? You cannot, then, offer it to his son, for they are not apart, and gifts to one are offered to the other. You know not God, because you know not this. The holy meeting place of the unseparated father and his son lies in the Holy Spirit and in you. Unbroken and uninterrupted love flows constantly between the Father and the Son, as both would have it be, and so it is. Let your mind wander not through darkened corridors, away from light's center. You and your brother may choose to lead yourselves astray, but you can be brought together only by the guide appointed for you and truth will make this plain to you as you are brought into the place where you must meet with truth. Where God is, there are you. Such is the truth. The link with which the Father joins himself to those he gives the power to create can never be dissolved. And heaven remains the will of God for you. Lay no gifts other than this upon your altars, for nothing can coexist with it. Your little gifts will vanish on the altar, where he has placed his own. In summary, section 8, The Holy Meeting Place, is saying, There is a holy meeting place within each and every one of us, a holy altar unto God upon which we join our mind to his. It is the place within our mind where our thoughts are generated, initiated by our beliefs, What we think about reflects what we believe, and these thoughts are what populate our altars. How cluttered with nonsensical debris must our altars appear to God? So far we have known not what we offer, but we do now. These thought offerings are our conversation with God in which we ask for the reality of our choosing. This is our power to create. 
if we think about the world and all the bodily identities with which we find fault, including our own, then this is what we are placing upon our altar as our offering to God. This is what we are saying is valuable to us and what we want more of. Let us not offer such dark thoughts to God. Let us only accept what He offers us, the unbroken and uninterrupted love that flows constantly between us and our Creator in the holy meeting place where Father and Son are joined. Section 9. The Reflection of Holiness The Atonement does not make holy. You were created holy. It merely brings unholiness to holiness, or what you made to what you are. Bringing illusion to truth or the ego to God is the Holy Spirit's only function. Bringing the ego to God is but to bring error to truth, where it stands corrected because it is the opposite of what it meets. It is undone because the contradiction can no longer stand. What disappears in light is not attacked. It merely vanishes because it is not true. The whole atonement is so gentle you need but whisper to it, and all its power will rush to your assistance and support. You are not frail with God beside you. God has not left his altar, though his worshippers placed other gods upon it. In the temple, holiness waits quietly for the return of them that love it. In this world you can become a spotless mirror in which the holiness of your Creator shines forth from you to all around you. You can reflect heaven here. Yet no reflections of the images of other gods must dim the mirror that would hold God's reflection in it. Reflections are seen in light. In darkness they are obscure, and their meaning seems to lie only in shifting interpretations rather than in themselves. The reflection of God needs no interpretation. Clean but the mirror, and the message that shines forth from what the mirror holds out to everyone to see, no one can fail to understand. Could you but realize for a single instant the power of healing that the reflection of God, shining in you, can bring to all the world? You could not wait to make the mirror of your mind clean to receive the image of the holiness that heals the world. Those who have learned to offer only healing because of the reflection of holiness in them are ready at last for heaven. They do not merely reflect truth, for they are truth. In summary, section 9, the reflection of holiness is saying, Our minds are capable of reflecting God's thoughts, the purity of his love for us and ours for him. Yet our minds are cluttered with thoughts quite the opposite of love in every way. Our thoughts are typically in a near-constant state of worry, despair, depression, anger, self-depreciation, or self-aggrandizement. The mirror of our mind is, at times, dark indeed. No reflection has ever been seen in a mirror placed in the dark. What is our motivation for bringing it out into the light? We are certainly afraid of what we will see. And yet God promises us that if, for only a single instant, we would allow ourselves to see his thoughts reflected there, we would heal the world. We are God's thoughts, so let us see him in all whom we look upon in our mind. In this light our mind becomes a clear reflection of his holiness, and heaven is brought to earth. Section 10 the equality of miracles. The reflections you accept into the mirror of your mind in time, but bring eternity nearer or farther. Reflect the peace of heaven here, and bring this world to heaven. In heaven, reality is shared and not reflected. By sharing its reflection here, its truth becomes the only perception the Son of God accepts. In this world, it is not true that anything without order of difficulty can occur. 
The miracle is the one thing you can do that transcends order, being based not on difference, but on equality. Miracles are not in competition, and the number of them that you can do is limitless. Perhaps you have been unaware of lack of competition among your thoughts, which even though they may conflict, can occur together and in great numbers. For some are reflections of heaven, while others are motivated by the ego which but seems to think. The result is a weaving, changing pattern that never rests and is never still. It shifts unceasingly across the mirror of your mind, and the reflections of heaven last but a moment and grow dim as darkness blots them out. It will seem difficult for you to learn that you have no basis at all for ordering your thoughts. This lesson the Holy Spirit teaches by giving you the shining examples of miracles to show you that your way of ordering is wrong but that a better way is offered you. The miracle offers exactly the same response to every call for help. It does not consider which call is louder or greater or more important. The power of God is limitless, and being always maximal, it offers everything to every call from every one. There is no order of difficulty here. The only judgment involved is the Holy Spirit's one division into two categories, one of love and the other the call for love. The ego is incapable of understanding content and is totally unconcerned with it. The study of the ego is not the study of the mind. In fact, the ego enjoys studying itself and thoroughly approves the undertakings of students who would analyze it thus approving its importance. Yet they but study form with meaningless content. Every interpretation you would lay upon a brother is senseless. Let the Holy Spirit show him to you and teach you both his love and his call for love. Neither his mind nor yours holds more than these two orders of thought. The miracle is the recognition that this is true. Earlier I said this course will teach you how to remember what you are, restoring to you your identity. We have already learned that this identity is shared. The miracle becomes the means of sharing it. How, then, can there be any order of difficulty among them? In summary, section 10, The Equality of Miracles is saying, our thoughts hold our power to create, and therefore our thoughts also hold our miracle-working power. The importance of being consciously aware of the quality of our thoughts cannot be emphasized enough. We give little attention to the direction of our thoughts. They range all over the emotional scale, shifting more quickly than clouds on a windy day. The ego is unconcerned with the content of our mind and is happy to let us go on living in a world of chaos, driven forward by minds in chaos. Do not waste any time analyzing your thoughts. They are based on what you see and experience here in this world of form. All thoughts about such things are false interpretations because it is a world stemming from ego thoughts. You will be having false thoughts about a false world. Learn to redirect your thinking once you catch yourself analyzing the world. You want to offer miraculous thoughts instead, thoughts that will restore this world to its proper vibration, which is unity, peace, and oneness. Believe this miraculous thought about everyone and everything, and you will have learned the equality of miracles by extending such thoughts to all. Section 11 the test of truth. Yet the essential thing is learning that you do not know. Everything you have taught yourself has made your power more and more obscure to you. You know not what it is nor where. Be willing then for all of it to be undone and be glad that you are not bound to it forever. For you have taught yourself how to imprison the Son of God, a lesson so unthinkable that only the insane in deepest sleep could even dream of it. 
Atonement teaches you how to escape forever from everything that you have taught yourself in the past by showing you only what you are now. Nothing you have ever learned can help you understand the present or teach you how to undo the past. Your past is what you have taught yourself. Let it all go. Do not attempt to understand any event or anything or anyone in its light, for the darkness in which you try to see can only obscure. You have only one test, as sure as God, by which to recognize if what you learned is true. If you are wholly free of fear of any kind, and if all those who meet or even think of you share in your perfect peace, then you can be sure that you have learned God's lesson and not your own. Unless all this is true, there are dark lessons in your mind that hurt and hinder you and everyone around you. Do not be concerned about how you can learn a lesson so completely different from everything that you have taught yourself. How could you know? When your peace is threatened or disturbed in any way, say to yourself, I do not know what anything, including this, means, and so I do not know how to respond to it, and I will not use my own past learning as the light to guide me now. By this refusal to attempt to teach yourself what you do not know, the guide whom God has given you will speak to you. He will take his rightful place in your awareness the instant you abandon it and offer it to him. You have no problems that he cannot solve by offering you a miracle. Miracles are for you, and every fear or pain or trial you have has been undone. The lessons you would teach yourself he has corrected already. They do not exist in his mind at all. God's Son will always be indivisible. As we are held as one in God, so do we learn as one in him. Listen in silence and do not raise your voice against him. Those who remember always that they know nothing and who have become willing to learn everything, will learn it. It is impossible to deny the source of effects so powerful they could not be of you. Leave room for him, and you will find yourself so filled with power that nothing will prevail against your peace. And this will be the test by which you recognize that you have understood. In summary, section 11, The Test of Truth, is saying, The ego has taught us many untruths, the most unthinkable being that we can depart from God's loving unity, that we can come into bodies of separation and live life independently from Him and each other. Our minds are polluted with such untruths. There seems to be no end and no escaping them. Yet, there is a single clear-cut way. Admit you do not know what anything is, what it means, or how to deal with it. How could we possibly know when all we have learned is illusion? This admission will restore peace to your mind, simply by taking the responsibility for knowing the mysteries of the universe off your mind. The next step is to give full control of your mind over to the Holy Spirit, who does know of such things. His mind does not contain your problems, only the solution. Let it all go, for this is not your real life. Then, silence your mind of all thoughts of the world, which resist the peace of God. Then your mind will expand to include the truth. There is nothing in all the world that can disturb your peace, for it is of God. The one sure test you have indeed learned the truth is a mind that rests in peaceful thoughts of others, and they of you. This concludes Chapter 14, Teaching for Truth. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to like and subscribe. And I have so much more to offer you on my website. You'll find the link to it under the About tab in the upper right-hand corner of this channel. See you there. Thanks again, and peace be with you.